Uh, okay, I'm Morten Sjöström. I work at the Mid-Sweden University uh, uh, and we have a research group that we call Multiprocessing and Imaging. Today I'm going to talk to you about realistic 3D technology to produce a, a life-life experience. And these are the things that I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to present the university very shortly. I'm going to talk about technologies to produce realistic 3D and I'm going to mention three problems and three solutions. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the full parallax imaging project that we're starting now. We are uh, eight uh, partners here in, in Europe. So we'll have a meeting today. So, and then we're going to contribute with modeling and compression. <coughs> so Mid Sweden University, the neighbor country of Finland, on the other side of the Baltic, uh, Mid Sweden means that it's in the center. So there we are. And we have active three campuses today. Hönösand will disappear next year, so we'll be moving to Sundsvall, so we'll only have two campuses. We have about 13,000 students, which is about 7,000 uh, full-time equivalents. A few bachelor's and master's programs, we have 1,000 employees, of which we have 90 professors and then approximately 193 PhD students. And then there is the turnover in Swedish Corona. So this is our research group. Uh, we are four senior researchers and we are between two and four PhD students normally and they s switch over time so actually the, the image there is not correct. I have a beard today and uh, we also have uh, these PhD students have finished. We focus on modeling of imaging systems. Uh, we processing of multidimensional data, 3D video uh, uh, and so on. Compression of multidimensional image and video and also quality assessment. We have a very nice laboratory. We have a lot of different equipment. We have different kind of displays. We have different kinds of cameras. Those are uh, planoptic cameras. There are 3D cameras. There are range cameras. We have measurement uh, equipment so we can test uh, different things. And we can also change the lighting so we have all of the uh, standardization uh, assessment. Uh, the assessment uh, standardization recommendations, I should say. So, today I'm going to talk about what we call realistic 3D. So, 3D that you can experience as if you were there. And we see this as a natural extension in a strive for, for an authentic presence, authentic telepresence. And it gives a greater experience. So, it has been used quite a lot in media, which is where it started, it's a very uh, driving force for, uh, for, uh, for uh, media. Uh, and then we have that also realistic 3D is a truthful presentation that gives a better foundation for, so it gives a foundation for a better understanding and a better assessment, meaning that you can use this to, to under, uh, investigate things too, to steer and control, to monitor things. <coughs> so the applications there are, are, first of all in media, of course, it's not like that. Uh, but also have medical applications where you have to be assessing what, what you see, uh, understand what is actually you, be, uh, you, you are investigating. And we did some tests with medical doctors a few years ago. Now industry, uh, uh, pro uh, processing industry is interesting in this because they can assess how they actually steer things when they don't want to be in the same place as what they are steering. Now when we talk about realistic 3D, we look from capture to presentation because we have to understand the whole processing chain in order to uh, give a good quality at the end. So this guy sitting over here, he, he uh, receives information from the 3D world through the capture. So how do we do the capture? They must be processed. Atana spoke a little bit of processing and quite a lot about processing. You have to distribute this over some kind of network and then you have to render it and display it as well. And eventually this guy has to look at it and he says, yeah, it looks good. And I guess that most of you sitting in this room today, you know that how we experience the, the realistic 3D. We, there is oh, different depth cues, both such that you can see on a normal TV, like perspectives, shading, and so on. But also the, the binocular where you have two eyes, so you can actually, by combining this information in your brain, you, you can see the, the range. So in order to, to experience this, you have to have a stereoscopic display, at least. So you can have one image to each eye. You preferably should also have a quite a wide screen in order to, to have an immersive experience. You see all the side information as well out here. Although you can't really experience depth here, you, you see it. 
one thing to make it realistic is also to, to have the motion parallax. You know, owls, the, they look like this. And this because they can then see what is close and far away. And then you need some um, multi-stereoscopic displays. Uh, and then it, what happens then is that, that the information is directed into different directions into the room. So one information is coming to your left eye and one to the right eye and you can experience this. And it, also if you move, you have two new views, so you have this motion parallax as well. The cost is that you reduce spatial resolution normally, unless you have a lot of pixels behind or if you have other uh, uh, technology where you, you can actually produce more. What is good that you can have this motion parallax, that's what I want to, to show with this image, and you become happy. Now, the next step is the light field displays. Uh, I guess those of you who were here yesterday, you listened to Tibor Barog uh, presenting their work. Uh, it has a high spatial and angular resolution. So you don't really see any jumps between views. It's very smooth and nice, and you, so it's all depending on where you view. But if you should be um, accurate, there is a difference between multi-view and light field rendering. And this is what I want to illustrate with this image here. This is a, a multi-view uh, um, rendering, meaning that the system here and the information is rendered such that if you look here, you have a very good resolution spatially. And you have it here as well and here as well. But in between, the quality is very bad. Here instead, you have distributed the same amount of information more equally. So you have a less resolution in each place, but you have a more equal quality. The advantage of this is that you can actually move around in this space and, and look. So if you move forward here and you look here, you have the light rays coming in the way they are actually in the room so that you will have a new perspective here that is how it would look like if you were in that place in the room. So that makes it more realistic. So if you capture this, what you do, you either have a lot of cameras next to one another. So this is what we call multi-view video. If you have extreme, you call it light field capture with cameras. The alternative is, of course, that you also measure the range directly. You can do that by correspondences between uh, RGB cameras, or you can use a range camera like this one. The advantage here is, of course, that you condense information, it's very easy to distribute it to the, the receiver. And it's also display agnostic in the sense that independent of the display that you have, you can render the views that you need. So you all have the views that you need. Very good, this is not very new. Uh, but there are some problems. First of all, these range cameras and also the correspondences uh, if you have multiple cameras, have very low resolution. So if you, we take this combination where we have a, a normal camera and a range camera, oops, there. This is the difference in size resolution. The pixels of this one is the same as this one. So you see this is about 65 times more information. And you need the one-to-one -one correspondence here in order to render the images. <coughs> so you have to somehow enlarge this. And if you do that directly, you get a very bad quality. So, and you will have a bad rendering of new images. And we don't want that. So, the solution is a depth-guided upscaling. Oh, sorry, it should be uh, RGB-guided upscaling. So, this is the information we start with. We have those two from the two cameras. The first thing we do is that we project this depth information onto the size of this one in the correct place. So it depends on the placement of the cameras, the lenses, and so on. So it will look approximately like this. We will also take away all the edges. So this is closer to the, uh, the camera, and this is farther away. And we take away the edges. And why do we do that? Because that is very uncertain information. We have calculated how uncertain it is under certain assumptions. It depends how far away the cameras are, how much noise you have in the uh, in the measurements and so on. The next thing we do is actually that we, we look at the edges in the depth camera and we compare it to the edges here. So we know that these are actually 
edges that exist both here and there, and then we say those are the edges that are belong to different objects. And by doing so, we can diffuse the information between here to fill the whole space. And the diffusion we do based on how probable, how uh, reliable this information is. And then we get to something like this. And this we can use to render the, the images. Now, that was the solution to the first problem. Second problem is disocclusion. And Atanas mentioned this as well. If you have a camera like this, this is what you see. If you use the depth information for that and you render a new view, you see that you have disocclusions here. There is no information and there's no way in the world that you can actually know what is there. We don't simply don't have that, so it's an ill post problem. So we have to somehow guess this. And one simple way of doing it is just to interpolate between these. And that works very well if the hole is small. Then uh, also the displays usually diffuse this a little bit, you can't even see that you have filled the holes. If the hole is larger, you have to find a way of actually filling this with a, a proper information that when you look at it, it looks good. And how do you do that? We go to the solution number two, which is depth guided in painting. In painting, you probably have tried in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in some programs saying that, okay, I have, a, I have to take away something and then please fill it with, with proper information. So what it does, it looks in the rest of the image to find information that we can uh, paste here and fill it. Now, since these are different depths, this is closer to the camera and this is farther away, we have to be assured that when we look for the things, we look through for the things in the background and not in the foreground and, and those comparisons are correct. We also have to make sure that we start at places where we have a high uh, gradient. So we make sure that this gradient comes in in a proper way. And if we do that, we get this, it fills it, and it looks quite good. This is information we did not have it before, but if you look, it looks good. This is actually one, one uh, first uh, algorithm we had. We have my, done better results now, and it looks like this. This is the warped view. The yellow is what is not there. This is the, the lacking information. You have some cracks. Those we usually just interpolate because we don't see those. And if you, if you just do interpolation for the, the large using a, a, a method called the standard version of VSRS, it doesn't look very well. And then there are different methods proposed by different people. But what you can notice here, in this special case, she has the hand in front of her body. She actually has three depths, her hand, her body, and the background. And when you look from another direction, this becomes a hole because you didn't see this part. And then it's filled with the background. So you see the background through her body. Suddenly she has a hole in her body. So you have to take that into your algorithm. So we made a layered approach. So we, we uh, in-paint in layers. And by doing so, we come to this result. So we, have the, we take away the hole. It's not perfect We're on the edges, but at least we solve that problem. So that was the solution to problem number two. Now, problem number three is we want to transmit this and we don't want to uh, use as little space as possible. Uh, if you take this image, you can see that uh, the data has a very different distribution than a normal image. This is fairly smooth, a big jump, and it's fairly smooth. So if you use normal uh, compression that for uh, normal images, you got edges that becomes very smooth. And that is a problem. When you render this with the smooth edges, it doesn't look very well. So this is the original depth, and this is the, the compressed depth with the standard, I think it's uh, HEVC uh, compression. So instead, what we have done is, is that we have looked into the edges, we identify the edges, we save the information on each side of the edges, because here it's fairly smooth, and on the other side it's fairly smooth. So we keep that. We subsampled it along the edge, and we keep that, we compress that, and we send it to the other side, and we do the, the inverse on the other side. We actually keep a few points on each side of the edge as well, just to make sure that we have uh, the, the curvature of, of the smoothness. And when you do that, 
we get to the proposed scheme and then you can see that the, the edges are very sharp of the beam here, whereas a very, it doesn't look very nice if you use the HEVC intra. So we have a solution to, to the problem number three as well. Now, let me continue what we're going to do in this new project that's starting now. We have two, stick, two, two early stage researchers. One is going to look into modeling and another one is going to look into compression. The modeling is going to look at geometrical optics and interperspective aliasing uh, for um, the light field systems and light field data. The second one is going to look into new formats and compression methods for uh, light field data. So if you look at what we've done before, it's the modeling of a plan optic camera. This is a, a, a sketch of a plan optic camera. You have image sensor, you have a lens letter A, and you have the main lens, and then you have some objects over here that you are taking pictures of. What we have done, we introduced a, a, what we call a light cone. So instead of just having one pixel and one ray in one direction, we look at several rays in, that comes into this cone, actually all rays that comes into this cone. We propagate this cone through the optical system and we get into the object space. So we have a light cone in the object space. If we do that for all pixels we have, we get a set of such light cones. And that is what we call the SPC model. This SPC model is very useful in the sense that you can predict the ability of the, the light field system, the light field capturing system. So one of the things that, yeah, that's what I was supposed to say as well. <laughs> Why you use this uh, cone is because the focus properties are represented in angular span and you will have much better results. So what we did now is that we looked at lateral resolution. That means what resolution can you uh, measure at different distances from the camera? So this is how we, we measured it. We have this board where we can actually see the resolution and we move the camera so we can see. And uh, we measured it, it's the blue line, and then we used the SPC model to predict it. And you can see that a very good correspondence. The, there is the pink line, uh, line as well, there's an analytical, uh, has done a lot of assumptions uh, that apparently doesn't fit so well with the reality. The other part that we're gonna do in this is that we do some compression or coding. What we've done so far uh, is among others this, coding of plane optic data by displacement intra. So we, we base the idea on the HEVC uh, and we say we want to code it within um, one image. So we want to predict this part here. This tuk -tuk. And this B we want to predict and then we search in the area of L0 and L1 because that is, has, has already been uh, decoded. So we search there and we say, find something that looks similar to what we uh, want. And then we say the best of this we, we save and say we just have to remember the, the, the vector between those two. So either the mean of those or uh, one of those that we keep and we transmit that. And on the other side, we can actually re reconstruct it very easily. If we have a video, we can also look into the previous and, and next frame to see if there is information that, that we used. If you do this and compare it to, this is JPEG 2000, the same compression ratio, uh, the HEV Sintra with the same compression ratio, and we, this is what we have proposed. Uh, I hope you can see that the one we have proposed is sharper after rendering, so uh, it wor works very well. We have also proposed new formats to this, but it becomes a bit complicated to explain, so if you want to know more about that, we can discuss it afterwards. We're very happy that our funders give us some money so we can continue our work. And this is, concludes my presentation.